good bright and early morning to everybody. We know more are coming in, going through security. We're also streaming this, and uh, uh, this will be on all the platforms of the Wilson Center. I'm just telling all of you, so you can tell all your friends to check us out. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm a uh, uh, escapee refugee from the United States Congress, which is how I first met Senator Cornyn, and uh, we are absolutely delighted to welcome him back here today for the third time. We have a signature wall inside for people who speak here, and he walked in the little room and pointed to his signature, which is pretty cool. I don't think I remember anyone else being able to do that. First of all, most of the signatures are illegible, so they wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but his was legible, and he is interesting, and he is right here. I do want to also recognize uh, our vaunted Mexico Institute. I think we have, everyone says uh, that we have, Eric, you're back. Uh, there he is. Well, we have escapees from the Mexico Institute, but we also have uh, uh, Duncan Wood, the director. We have Ambassador Tony Wayne. We have Chris Wilson, and we have others that I'm sure I'm not recognizing. And we have Diana Negroponte right in the front row looking at me, mm -hmm. uh, whose husband John was ambassador in the region and who knows a lot about a lot. So, uh, last time John Cornyn was here, we think, was 2017. Is that right? Sounds about right. Time flies when you're having fun. He is now in his third term. He was the Senate Majority Whip until recently. He serves on the Finance, Judiciary, and Intelligence Committees. He's a rare senator who gets excited, listen up, about the details of policy, not just politics. He's just the kind of senator the Wilson Center loves. And so it's great to have you back. Senator uh, Cornyn also chairs the Senate Narcotics Caucus and has been working on a package of bills. Listen up, bills. That means legislation, not just press releases, not just uh, you know decorating White House conferences. It means bills, legislation, which the Senate is supposed to do, uh, related to counter-narcotics cooperation among the US, Mexico, and Central America. His work is comprehensive, covering border security, foreign aid, anti-cartel policies, and trade. Maybe it's just me, but speaking as a policy junkie, this seems like a better way than Twitter to address the border problem. No comment necessary. As you know, John, the Wilson Center has the only Mexico Institute located in Washington. Uh, our extremely able director, Duncan Wood, is right there. He has directed our institute for six years and the Institute is part of the reason why the Wilson Center, for the second year in a row, has been voted by our peers number one in regional studies in the world out of 6,500 think tanks. And we're very proud of that. We're also delighted to help your efforts any way we can through our research, especially on trade and counter-narcotics. And so now, let's jump into our discussion. There are two big issues. One, the border. Um, I think as of today, I haven't heard that the news changed, uh, President Trump is still talking about cutting off aid to the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and possibly, hasn't happened yet, closing the border, quote, for a long time. Um, asking you uh, what you think of each of these ideas and what might we do as an alternative? Well, I don't... Uh... I understand the president's frustration. The frustration primarily is because of our asylum policy. It was started out, as I recall, during the tenure of George W. Bush, where an anti-trafficking piece of legislation was uh, signed into law, which was designed to protect children uh, coming across the border from human trafficking. And um, now the uh, the criminal organizations that move people from Central America through Mexico into the United States have figured this out. And instead of people trying to break their way into the United States, so to speak, they show up at the border and turn themselves in. And because they know that they uh, are able to overwhelm our capacity to deal with these asylum cases. Last time I heard there were some 700,000 backlog asylum cases. And uh, I believe this, the latest statistics I saw that if you are able to make your way into the United States as either an unaccompanied child and your place with a sponsor, 
in the United States, maybe a couple of years before you get around to an uh, immigration judge hearing your case, or a family unit involving, including children, then you have about a 98% chance of successfully staying in the United States. So a lot of the discussion we've been having, as important as it is, border security, really is uh, sort of beside the point when it comes to the massive flow of humanity coming from Central America. And uh, we've got simply have to have to figure this one out. Uh, in terms of the foreign aid, I've talked to your uh, outstanding staff here at the Wilson Center. Uh, I think Congress really does not know what works and what does not work. Um, I don't know whether we ought to triple our foreign aid budget or quadruple it or quintuple it or cut it to zero because I'm just not really sure exactly what works. I think the president's looking for some kind of leverage anywhere he can get it uh, to try to stop what, what he sees as an out of control situation. I agree it is out of control. 76,000 people uh, showed up at the border last month. They were on track for another 100,000 this month and there's no real reason why that number would get smaller and every reason why it will get bigger until, we, until Congress acts. And it's clear Congress needs to, needs to act. So uh, that's maybe a long-winded short answer. Well, it's, it's not a long-winded answer because the solution is long-winded. It's, it's, it's not a tweet, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And let me just unpack a little bit more of it. In 2017, last time you were here, uh, I know that Mike Pence, then the Vice President, and, and John uh, Kelly, mm -hmm. then the Secretary of Homeland Security, and Luis Moreno, a good friend of ours, the head of the uh, Organization for American IDB, got it, uh, convened a conference in Miami. And the point of it was to stop the push factors that push these people out of the Northern Triangle. And what was talked about, I was not there, but I heard about it from Mike Pence, who was here, and we had a conversation about it uh, that year. Uh, the point of it was to try to shore up the capacity of the governments in the region mm -hmm. to fight corruption uh, and gangs and to encourage business investment there so that jobs could be built. Mm -hmm. That was the administration policy. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it still isn't the administration policy, but specifically, if we cut off aid to those three countries, don't we undermine the policy? Um, yes, is, is the short answer. Um, I think one of the biggest problems we have is, is um, reliable partners mm -hmm. in those countries. We can't do for them what they are unwilling to do for themselves. We've tried nation building in Afghanistan and Iraq. I was gonna say, uh, the this only, applies worldwide, not just I think to so. this region. And the, I mean, people mentioned Plan Colombia as the one successful mm -hmm. effort, but that's because we had people like President Uribe and others that worked with us. It was over the long haul, it was bipartisan, right. and um, it by and large I think is a, is a success story even though they continue to have big challenges there with the cocoa um, um, mm -hmm. production and the cocaine that comes from it. So there's not a lot of great examples of, of what works, but again, this is not to be too patronizing, but this is where um, organizations like yours can help us. Um, oh, go ahead. Sort keep, through keep talking about that. what works and what doesn't work. Because, Don't hold back. Because as you know, uh, being a former member of Congress, it's hard to go home and, and say, we're taking your tax dollars and we're sending those to a That's foreign exactly country. That's true. And you know, we're not really sure we're doing any good. Um, if you can actually demonstrate it with some metrics uh, that you're making progress, people will accept that. But I think just uh, saying, well, we're sending money to the Northern Triangle, it's, it's a little hard for them to uh, uh, accept given the, the huge inflows of humanity coming from those countries and it doesn't look like it's gonna get smaller anytime soon. But if, I'm just saying, in theory, their governments functioned and they could be employed and the, the MS-13 program problem were, were substantially reduced, they would not have the need to flee up here. Agree. Yeah, so it would, it would reduce the push factor. I'm not saying it would eliminate it. There still are bad actors and coyotes and all the rest of it. Well, I was talking to Senator Rubio this morning. I said, America's still the richest country in the world, and we're probably never going to eliminate the desire of people right. who are of, of, uh, you know, in, living in poverty wanting to come to the United States, but at least we need to try to get 
get it under control and fall within our legal, uh, orderly immigration system. Which is why we need uh, a, a revamped, modernized, I would say, immigration policy that Agreed. deals with these issues. Uh, Kirsten Nielsen, who is the Secretary of Homeland Security, is someone I know pretty well, and we were having a conversation recently about finding a way to, uh, uh, for, it needs to be obviously a safe and protected way, I don't know if it's workable, and, but she's interested in it, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, process the asylum claims at home before mm -hmm. these folks leave their country. Uh, we looked at it here, she asked us to think about it, and we thought, in theory, great, but in practice, almost impossible, given how dangerous it is there. Mm -hmm. Do you see any hope for you know, local asylum to be, be expanded, local asylum process to be expanded? My understanding is if somebody actually comes to the United States and seeks asylum and ultimately ends up going in front of an immigration judge, that they have about a 20% chance mm -hmm. of success. Um, as I said, given the current dysfunction, they have about a 98% chance of success. And so I think, I I think it's, yeah. uh, it's hard to see why somebody would seek asylum in their home country when they have a much better chance, albeit through the tortuous journey from uh, Central America to, uh, to the United States uh, in the hands of very dangerous and ruthless right. people. So, and with, um, with you know, a, a, a large toll, especially on teenage girls and others who no, no question are at risk. If, if we could figure some way to deal with, um, uh, deal with the current asylum dysfunction, um, and Henry Cuellar, my, my uh, partner in a lot of- Who happens to be in the other political party, he's, he's just a, pointing he's, that out. He's a good old blue dog Democrat. Uh, Henry from Laredo, Texas, and he understands these issues as better than uh, most people. And uh, we've actually had some legislation we introduced a few years ago to try to deal with the way asylum is dealt with, because as I mentioned earlier, if you're from a non-contiguous country, it's different than if you're from right. Canada or Mexico, and we ought to find some way to make that uniform. Um, once we were able to do that, then I think maybe the, there would be more interest in seeking asylum from uh, our consulates in, uh, in those countries. And speaking of immigration, just two points to ask you about. First of all, it's certainly my theory. I'm, I'm the daughter of an immigrant. One of my parents was an actual immigrant, and the other one was the daughter of immigrants. I'm sure your family came from someplace else. Somewhere. Uh, America is stronger because of immigration. That would be my theory. Of course. Legal immigration course. we're talking about. But Congress, under the, in the George W. Bush administration, almost passed what was called Comprehensive Immigration Reform. I was proud to vote for it, and it failed by just a few votes. Is there any chance, any chance that either that approach or something more updated, because that again was a decade ago or more, uh, could come back and, 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 and be supported on a bipartisan basis in Congress? Well, I'm an optimist by nature, but I'm not optimistic about that happening in this current political environment. Hmm. I did, um, about a year ago, uh, President Trump did something that honestly no other Republican president probably could have done and offered a pathway to citizenship for 1.8 million DACA eligible mm -hmm. uh, young adults. Mm -hmm. To me, that was a very generous and sensible uh, thing to do. And it was tied up with other things that were more controversial and ultimately did not get uh, passed. But I, I remain somewhat hopeful that we can at least deal with some pieces of this. I think if we can make a down payment and demonstrate some good faith and make some progress and try to punch the reset button, uh, maybe we could deal with some of these other issues. But right now, I think the issues are so politically potent on both sides of the aisle um, that some people cling to the issue and really aren't as, as uh, adamant about seeking a solution. And poison pills are added to bills, good bills, sure. on, by both sides, which make them impossible to pass. Mm -hmm. And sadly, at least I would say, I don't, I don't work there anymore, so I'm saying it, that blaming the other side for not solving the problem is often a better reelection strategy than mm -hmm. working with the other side, which makes you bipartisan, which makes you vulnerable in a primary right. on each side. Is that right? That's right. And you know, blame, the blame game is a, uh, is a world-class sport here inside the Beltway. Well, it's, uh, 
it's uh, a tragedy. It it's is. really a tragedy. The nation is suffering and our standing in the world is suffering because Congress doesn't work better. Congress doesn't work better. I'm not talking about the Trump administration. I'm talking about the place that you work, mm -hmm. uh, which is why, uh, as Lindsey Graham calls this place, it is a safe political space where we can discuss issues seriously and engage civilly, uh, which doesn't happen that much a mile from here. Not enough. So turning to another good news story. Actually, there was a piece of good news we were talking about it, uh, just before we started the program, and that is that China announced, I think today, or at least it's in the news today, that it is going to forbid the export of fentanyl. And the opioid crisis is huge, and you know a great deal about it. And uh, it is ravaging communities across the United States. Our Mexico Institute has studied this uh, subject carefully. And Duncan, maybe you could ask the first question, which would also be putting out the information about what we're doing here on this. But it shows that while Mexico is one player among many in the fentanyl supply chain, its role is growing. Uh, so with this Chinese announcement, is this good news to reduce uh, the drug supply through Mexico to the U.S. And we were talking about the, the basic ingredients of fentanyl. Or how should we understand this? And what more can we do? Uh, can you do? Can Congress do uh, to uh, to at least uh, uh, provide provide some relief from this huge scourge across America? I think it's very good news. Um, President Trump said that he talked directly to President Xi and asked them to, uh, to do this, and it's, I think it's a demonstration of good faith. Um, I have no doubt that uh, there'll be some way to try to work around it, um, because if there's demand, uh, the supply will follow. But um, last year, CDC, the C uh, Center for Disease Control, documented more than 70,000 overdose deaths in the United States, 70,000. What I think about, Jane, when I, the 9-11, we lost 3,000 Americans and we went to war over that. We lost 70,000 Americans due to drug overdoses last year. About half of those, I understand, are opioid related, which includes prescription drugs, fentanyl, the synthetic opioid, and then uh, heroin, which is cheap from, uh, and but fentanyl is, is particularly potent and um, that's, uh, uh, cause of a lot of the drug overdoses. But this is a very positive development, but the, as you know, the precursor chemicals right. come from China. Uh, they can now probably come from some other source and find their way as long as the demand exists. But I, I would say, uh, let's look for, let's identify or claim this is good news because I yeah. think it is. And let's look for a little good news. Yeah, we need it's some good a, news. a pretty dreary news cycle, just saying. Okay, so another maybe well, I don't know if this is good news yet, but there is a new NAFTA out there mm -hmm. called USMCA, and it was negotiated uh, last year among the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. It has not yet, I think, been sent to Congress right. for ratification because of the way the clock works. Um, but I recall back in the day, I was not part of this, but each party has a strong anti-trade wing. I was not in that wing of my party. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think the chances are that if it is sent up before 2020, uh, that this will get ratified? I believe, uh, according to the shot clock, uh, it uh, can come about mid-April. But once it comes to us, as you know, under Trade Promotion Authority, Congress really can't change it. It's an up or down vote in both chambers, a majority vote. About uh, trade getting a little bit of a black eye in both political parties, uh, when we passed Trade Promotion Authority under President Obama, um, it took 60 votes in the Senate. We had 13 Democrats vote for it and 47 Republicans. And since then, mm -hmm. I would say, it's gotten, trade's gotten even a, a, a more tarnished. Um, That's what in, I think, in, too. In, the, in our politics. Yeah. So it's certainly not a guarantee. I'm pleased that, um, that Ambassador Lighthizer was able to negotiate this. I'm happy that, um, that we have the uh, proposed um, trade agreement between Mexico and Canada. As you know, it supports a lot of jobs here in America. NAFTA, um, about five million jobs, American jobs because of Mexico, trade with Mexico, about eight million with Canada. So this is vitally important, touches every state, every congressional district in the country. What I'm hopeful for is that uh, Speaker Pelosi will see this as a priority and, uh, 
and notwithstanding sometimes the zero-sum game politics here where somebody wins and somebody loses, people can look at this as a bipartisan win working with the administration to get this across the finish line. It's vitally important to my state, but I would argue it's, it's vitally important to the United States. Well, the border states are most impacted by cross-border manufacturing, both on the southern border and the northern border. Let's think cars and other things that right. well, Michigan and other states there's about make. Three, I think uh, Customs and Border Protection told me that there's $3 billion worth of trade going in and out of Texas ports of entry alone, not to mention the other border states. So that's a huge amount of money. Well, speaking of that, though, uh, one of, uh, you know, it, it's true, it, it's a frustrating time in terms of this huge crisis on the border, but President Trump is threatening to close the southern border. Uh, that would obviously impact the same $3 billion a day that you're talking about. I mean, yeah. what are the chances do you think he, that he would try to do that? And would, would the courts possibly enjoin the action? Yeah, it's, I, hope we, I hope we don't have to find out uh, uh. because I think it would be so disruptive. Our economy obviously is doing much better than it has done and been doing in a long time. And um, I'm, this would very, this would be really rattle uh, our friends and allies. We were talking earlier how pleasantly surprised that I am, and I think you said you were, with how uh, President Lopez Obrador has been um, working with us yeah. on some of the asylum flow, allowing people to claim asylum and wait in Mexico, even offering them asylum there or and work permits. That is a huge, huge thing, and. If, um, if we were to do something uh, that would jeopardize that burgeoning relationship and cause them to view us more in an adversarial posture, I think they'd be less inclined to cooperate on well, things like I, that. Well, I come from Los Angeles, grew up there. My congressional district was there. I'm still a resident there, and I've always called it North Mexico, hmm. uh, given the population. And <laughs> at least to me, uh, open, tra open borders, open trade, mm -hmm. uh, working on problems together is always the better approach. Well, you get in trouble where, if you call it open borders, but open <laughs> free trade. Uh, oh, well said. <laughs> free trade. I don't mean. <laughs> so you're not running me. for election. Thank anymore. you. Yeah. <laughs> so the. Uh, this but, is my but, friend. But free Listen trade. up, folks. This is my friend, and you know, with if we help each other out a little bit, we, we get a lot farther. Okay. Well, we. Uh, but but trade is trade is vitally important, and if, and this is one of the areas where I think. You know, we, we, we knew that we got an unconventional president in 2016. A lot of his instincts, I would argue, on regulation and taxation and just generally business environment are very positive. And I think, you know, the economy is responding for a variety of reasons, but I think in part to that. But I do think some of the trade uh, saber rattling on tariffs and the like is causing some consternation. It may even be impossible to get the votes on the new uh, Mexico, oh. Canada, uh, U.S. Mexico, USMCA. It's USMCA. A, it's a, yeah. We may not even be able to get the votes in the Senate for the bill as long as the 232 tariffs are still uh, outstanding. Well, I, I think in Mexico and Canada, probably the same thing. They probably can't pass it either. Well, Canada was particularly stung by being hit with tariffs uh, by invoking a national security section mm. of our trade law. Last time I looked, Canada was our ally. Um, that's a personal well, side. All you have to do is go to, go to NORAD in uh, Colorado <laughs> Springs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last, last question for me, uh, Venezuela, another easy problem. Um, it, it's not just, it seems to me, um, the government and, and its, its dysfunction in Venezuela, but now Venezuela is overlaid with a proxy war right. with Russia's presence and our presence. And uh, what, if, if uh, President Trump called you up right now, or in your role as a senior leader in Congress, what should the U.S. government be doing that would have the most productive effect on, on creating a, a Venezuela that takes care of his people and stems this gigantic refugee problem and delivers services, including electricity, on a daily basis? Well, as you know, um, there is sort of a proxy battle going on, um, and Cuba uh, plays a key role in providing the security forces for Maduro. And um, I think the administration has actually handled it pretty well by supporting the uh, interim president, Guaido, mm -hmm. and, uh, and arguing for a, uh, uh, a solution consistent with the Venezuelan constitution itself. 
Uh, Maduro is uh, being propped up by the Russians. Uh, they sent in a couple of planes with about a, a hundred uh, Russians to uh, sort of make a show of force here. Reminds me of what uh, Rex Tillerson, our former Secretary of State, said that Putin wakes up in the morning thinking, where in the world are the, are the Americans having problems and how can we make it worse? Uh, well, that's, there's sort of, that's sort of, to me, the mentality I see at play in Venezuela. But there's a huge stake there. Um, obviously, it's a humanitarian mm -hmm. crisis in, in, in Colombia. Yeah. A lot of refugees fleeing there. I was down on the border of uh, Venezuela and Colombia watching Venezuelans come across with their empty suitcases and buying uh, sundries, various you know, um, uh, things that they couldn't get in their own country. But it's a huge, it's a huge problem. And I think we're kind of on the knife's edge right now. We don't really know uh, what the military is going to do uh, as long as they're supporting Maduro, as long as the Cuban um, and the Cubans and the Russians and the Chinese are propping up Maduro. Uh, it's really, the outcome's uncertain, but the, the stakes are very high. Well, we've said, or I think we have said, the administration has said, all options are on the table. Right. That means including the military option. The neighbors around uh, Venezuela are not suggesting that they would provide any military aid. So do you think it's realistic that the U.S. would go in alone with military force, and do you think that would be a smart thing to do? I think it's highly unlikely. Uh, we have some good partners to, uh, we're working with in the region, uh, right. particularly the Colombians, um, with whom we have an excellent relationship. And I just think um, we need to have all of our um, assets working, whether it's our intelligence community, uh, diplomatic efforts um, 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 across the board, um, because I, I think it really is uh, teetering on that knife's edge, and I can't tell you as we sit here which way it's going to fall, right. but the consequences couldn't be uh, more important. Well, let me invoke, you know, horror stories like Syria, Yemen, places where military intervention uh, has not created better outcomes. Yeah, it's, uh, what was it? Colin Powell's, uh, what do you call it? Pottery, Pottery barn, barn rule. rule. You break it, you own it. Yeah. That was for Iraq. Yeah, mm. well, it, it applies, yeah. I would say it probably applies here, here as well. Well, on that cheery note, why don't we take some questions? Let me call on Duncan first to explain some of the things, microphone's coming, some of the things that we are doing, the Mexico Institute is doing with relation to the opioid and other issues we've discussed. Thank you, James. Senator Cornyn, thank you for being here with us today. Um, yes, the Mexico Institute has recently published a couple of papers on, uh, on fentanyl, um, looking at, first of all, Mexico's role in the fentanyl trade. Um, and that it is a very, very important uh, stopping off point for fentanyl coming in from China, and in particular coming in through the Pacific ports. And one of the policy ideas that we've been discussing here at the Mexico Institute is uh, enhanced U.S.-Mexico cooperation in Mexican ports, so that perhaps you could have uh, CBP officers down there that would be able to perhaps pre-clear those containers that are coming in from China that will make their way up to the the border crossing into Texas in Laredo. Imagine if you could have uh, US agents there that would actually be able to um, go through the contents of the containers, seal them up again. This would be enhanced security for Mexico and for the United States, and it would be much more efficient in terms of moving those containers once they get to the, the US border. So that's one idea, that, mm -hmm. so simple things like that. Um, the other paper that we've published recently is looking at uh, the impact of fentanyl on uh, Mexico itself. And the fact is what we've uh, been able to observe is that those communities, rural communities that were producing uh, opium for export to the United States during the heroin boom have seen their income decimated in, the, in recent months because fentanyl has undercut their business. Mm. And so the most recent up-to-date news that we have from Mexico is that many of those same farmers who were growing poppies are now turning to cooking fentanyl. And there is a boom in fentanyl production. This is the good news? Yeah. So again, once again, it's doubly important that we have a clear idea on what kind of precursor chemicals are coming into, into Mexico. And so leading into my question, um, you know, 
one of the most important elements of U.S.-Mexico security cooperation over the past 12 years has, of course, been the Merida Initiative. And Eric Olson has recently penned a, uh, a paper based upon a brainstorming session we had here at the Wilson Center on how we could take the Merida Initiative uh, forward. I mean, critical to that, of course, are questions of money laundering uh, or anti-money laundering, uh, obviously intelligence sharing between Mexican and U.S. authorities. But I'd be really interested in hearing your views on sort of the most productive ways forward on security cooperation with Mexico. Well, thank you for the question. I, I should have mentioned uh, the Merida Initiative as an example of a success when it comes to the U.S. spending money in other countries. So we, uh, we were talking more generally about that. But I, we, I very much uh, personally appreciate the good work that the Wilson Center has done on this. Uh, I mentioned before we came out here that the Congress is not exactly a think tank. Um, and we need the best ideas and the research uh, uh, to help us make good policy decisions. But I do think we need to uh, uh, work with the Lopez Obrador administration to update the Merit Initiative. Uh, we know that a lot of the training uh, that's given to Mexican law enforcement is very important. We know that the National Guard that President Lopez Obrador is, is, uh, is building and deploying to try to deal with some of the local corruption issues and the difficulty at the municipal and state level uh, is, is very important. And uh, I think we need to continue to be fully engaged in that. We also, as I recall, uh, we also expanded some of the Merida uh, initiative to allow Mexico to use some of that money to deal with their own border problems uh, on the south. And uh, I think that was money, uh, money well spent, although we still have a long conversation to continue to have with uh, the Mexican government about that whole issue. But I think those it's, we have seen very positive results, and uh, we need to build on that. Well, good. I'm, I'm going to recognize you in a second. I just want to comment on your comment that Congress is not a learning institution. Um, I, I, uh, Lisa Murkowski. I said, I said think tank. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, well, I'll say it. Congress is not a learning institution, <laughs> okay, but there are learning senators, and that was my point. Lisa Murkowski was here last week. Uh, we have a polar initiative, and she mm -hmm. is she and Angus King co-chair the uh, Arctic Caucus, and she knows a ton about the issues. And she's a learning senator, and she takes the time to learn policy, and 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 go. I've seen her do it. Shows up at conferences and stays an extra day to learn more. Mm -hmm. And you're a learning senator too. So I was That's just fine. about to say something positive. Thank just you. thought thought Thank you'd you. like to hear that uh, in the corner here. Identify yourself and ask your question. Howard Woldridge, retired police detective from Fort Worth, with Citizens Opposing Prohibition Cops. For Senator, um, across America today, 10 children, teenagers, will be shot, shot dead selling illegal drugs off sidewalks. This has been going on now for 47 years. We've spent a trillion dollars in money, and tens and tens of thousands of our children have been shot and shot dead due to our modern prohibition. If the Congress adopted all kinds of great ideas that are out there, in what year do you think we would see a reduction in the number of children shot, shot dead, selling drugs off sidewalks? Well, um, there's no question that violence and drugs go together. Uh, we've seen the spike in Mexico where the cartels are fighting for market share and control of territory, and it's a bloody, uh, terrible thing to be endured by the Mexican people. And there's no question that the tentacles from the drug trade extend into the United States, whether they, because it's part of their distribution network. Um, I would just, I would answer, try to answer your question in part by saying this. There about, there's a number of states that have legalized marijuana uh, for recreational and other use. One of the things I hope our caucus that uh, Senator Feinstein and I co-chair will look at in addition to the issues we're talking about here today, is the public health consequences mm -hmm. um, of, of that mm -hmm. process because mm -hmm. marijuana continues to be a, a scheduled drug for federal purposes, but the federal government's pretty much been hands off and allowed states to, to chart their own course. I don't think we know what the public health consequences are or would be if we were to lift the prohibition on, uh, on other, other drugs. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to quibble with the violence issue associated with drugs. I just don't know what the consequences would be of lifting, uh, of changing the laws with regard to either marijuana or other drugs. Um, I would want to tread very cautiously. Mm -hmm. Other questions? 
Diana. Senator Diana Negroponte from the a scholar here at the Wilson Center. Nice we focused you. on the violence in the Northern Triangle, but events in Nicaragua, the authoritarian repressive rule of Daniel Ortega and his vice president, Murillo, his wife, have caused a flow of refugees and asylum seekers into the United States for causes quite different from the violence in Northern Triangle. What actions are the Senate considering to seek to contain the violence in Nicaragua and thus restrain the flow of refugee seekers into the U.S.? Well, I wish I, wish I could give you chapter and verse, but I, I do recall uh, back during the negotiations over the Central American Free Trade Agreement uh, traveling to the region, and that was before Ortega, uh, Daniel Ortega came back into power, and uh, there was actually some hope uh, for a better, uh, better direction, not only in Nicaragua, but in, in Central America generally. Uh, I know he's, he's a terrible uh, dictator and uh, is, a, uh, is somebody we would like to see replaced with a democratically elected um, president, but uh, I'm not specifically aware of what the government is doing now to try to encourage him to leave. Unfortunately, we've been unsuccessful many, many years. He seems to come back time and time again, sort of a, um, in a new, uh, um, he, he won't leave the stage. And uh, I think the region and that country certainly would be better off if he did. Um, I w I've been trying to think of some good news while we're waiting for another question. I, I have a piece of good news. Tomorrow, um, the, the Secretary General of NATO is speaking to Congress, uh, a, a, an address to the, joint, to the joint session of Congress, invited by uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Speaker Nancy Pelosi. They would be of different political parties. And he's speaking to a Congress that is, uh, I think by and large, uh, by overwhelming uh, numbers, uh, supportive of NATO. That doesn't mean people don't think uh, members of NATO should pay their full share of dues, but it does mean they support the common defense provision of NATO. So I'm just asking, could that possibly, the fact that Congress is doing something on a bipartisan basis be contagious and maybe lead to some more bipartisanship? Or am I sadly del delusional? No, I think um, there's, as you know, Jane, most of what makes news is about where we disagree and when we agree or when there's consensus that's not news and so people don't hear about it. But I, I agree with you about the importance of NATO and our friend uh, Kay Bailey Hutchison, the ah. former senator from Texas, is now the ambassador to NATO. I'm looking forward to seeing her in Brussels here in a couple weeks. Um, but NATO is critically important to, uh, to, to the peace in Europe and um, because Putin hates it, uh, I love it even more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he's doing, of course, everything he can to under, undermine, um, undermine the uh, uh, NATO and the United States' uh, uh, involvement uh, there. But just in terms of, uh, of maintaining the peace in Europe and uh, uh, thwarting uh, Putin's worst instincts when it comes to trying to restore the great Russian empire, uh, NATO is absolutely critical. Well, I, I do think, um, you know, this touches on a number of issues, including our nuclear weapons policy that uh, we can perhaps talk about at another time. But uh, I'm, glad that the, I'm glad that he will be there tomorrow. Well, uh, Kay, as you would expect, is a very good friend of mine, sure. too. She served briefly on the board of the Mexico Institute, and she'll be here in the morning uh, bringing 20 uh, of the perm reps to NATO oh, here oh, for good. breakfast. Oh, You're welcome to come if you'd like to come. Oh, uh, but we are having a conversation, and the head of our Kennan Institute, our Russia Institute, will be part of that conversation, talking about Russia and Russia's relationship, good and bad, uh, with Europe. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about that, That's and I'll great. be I'll be uh, up there for the for the address. I think it's a it's a meaningful thing, both Agreed. in terms of bipartisanship and in terms of what NATO means. And I would just point out that uh, uh, unsolicited by us, NATO invoked Article Five. Uh, on uh, right after 9/11, right. unsolicited by us, Nick Burns was then the ambassador to NATO, and he was just told, "We're doing this," 
And that ought to count for something. I worry about the domestic politics and some of our NATO partners, whether yeah. depending on how Putin. Well, some people worry about ours too. Well, that's you should know. <laughs> We're just just count us, mark us down as worried. <laughs> Yes. Uh, other, come on. Other questions. All in the front row. All right. Chris Wilson. What about the rest of you? Thanks. Come on. We have time for a few more. Chris Wilson, ah. the Mexico Institute. I know, Senator, that you've been over the years a big supporter of the North American Development Bank, the NAD yeah. Bank. Uh, and I, I believe that you've recently introduced some legislation to help further strengthen it. I was wondering if you could, it, that, you know, the North American Development Bank does work on both sides of the border to build infrastructure, uh, particular green infrastructure. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could just give us a, a sense as to whether or not you feel like the legislation might be moving. Can you tell us a little bit about what it includes as well? Yeah, my, my, uh, my partner on, on that legislation is Senator Dianne Feinstein. And again, maybe this is the exception to the rule, but um, I've found that if you want to get something done in Congress, working with a Democrat is a pretty good idea. Matter of fact, is the only way you get things done. Did everyone hear that? <laughs> Were you listening? And uh, she's a, because we both serve on the Senate um, uh, Judiciary Committee um, and also come from border states and we serve on the Intelligence Committee together. She's, she's terrific. And uh, we do have our disagreements, but, but they're respectful uh, and polite. But for every NAD bank dollar uh, that's been invested in an infrastructure project, there's been, an, um, it's leveraged about $20 in total infrastructure investment using both private and public sector dollars. And that's been over the last 20 years. So we've, Senator Feinstein and I have introduced legislation that would authorize the Treasury Department to increase NAD Bank's uh, uh, capital and provide additional authority related to port of entry infrastructure, which seems to be a common point of, of interest uh, on a bipartisan basis. So yes, that's uh, something we're doing together. And I'm, since I don't think it's particularly controversial, I think it's something we can and should get done. So next time when you come back for your fourth appearance, you will report that that has been done. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All righty now. <laughs> Kent Hughes. Uh, I'm Kent Hughes here at the Wilson Center. Returning to the question of NATO, there's a growing concern by the Trump administration mm -hmm. about Turkey's apparent decision mm. to buy the, uh, air defense equipment from Russia and even possibly limiting the sale of the F-35, which I know was made there in Fort Worth. Where does that stand in the Congress, and what would your own advice be to the administration? Well, as, as you saw, there uh, was some news, I think it was today or maybe yesterday, about the... Uh, um, the election. Uh, the F-30, well, the, oh. elect the elections mm. were certainly very significant in terms yeah. of Erdogan's uh, power, um, but he has been... Uh, uh, he has not been a friend <laughs> to the United States, to say the least. And um, the fact that uh, he's their partner on the F-35, our most advanced fifth generation uh, fighter, and many of the parts uh, that go into that are produced in Turkey. Um, obviously, as part of that supply chain, they've played a very important role, which means that um, it's, it really is a head scratcher uh, why Erdogan would uh, purchase the most sophisticated air defense system that, the, that Russia offers, the SA-400. It just is uh, completely incompatible to have an F-35 sitting next to a, a Russian air defense system. Uh, and uh, that's why I think you saw the, 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 the announcement on the F-35. Unfortunately, because of the supply chain issues in Turkey, it's gonna take a while, uh, but I believe it's already begun to try to replace that supply chain with alternative uh, sourcing. Um, but Turkey, as you know, has just been uh, 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 nothing but trouble dealing with the very people who helped us wiped out, wipe out the caliphate of ISIS in, uh, in Syria. And now we are the only ones standing between um, those Kurdish forces that right. helped us uh, do that and uh, Turkey, because I think given their free hand, they would just uh, they'd go in and uh, slaughter them. So I think it's good news that instead of pulling all of our troops out from uh, Syria, as the president initially announced, he's backed off that sum, and there will be at least a thousand troops on a flexible basis. Yep. And they're not ground troops; they are advisors and trainers. But it, they will be uh, in parts of uh, Syria that are especially where the Kurds are especially vulnerable. Right. And we are we are a stabilizing force there, um, and I think in, indispensable, unfortunately, under these circumstances. Uh, I think we strongly agree. I'm gonna, Duncan, I'm going to ask. 
let's see, where are we? Right over here, and then right behind you first. And then if we have time, we'll come back. Yes. Good morning, Senator. My name is uh, Steve McFarland, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Guatemala under Presidents Obama and President Bush, and originally from Meridian, Texas. Ah. Oh, you uh, check all the boxes. He does. <laughs> so, I like um, him already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, some would say that uh, one of the causes of uh, immigration from Central America, the Northern Triangle, lie in weak states, um, lack of services that in turn are the result of uh, corruption. The U.S. played a uh, lead role uh, starting under President Bush, continuing under uh, President Obama and under the uh, first year and a half of uh, President Trump, but since September has backed away from supporting uh, this uh, international effort known as CSIG. And so the question would be, what, sir, do you believe is the uh, importance that, we, that the U.S. should attach to uh, supporting anti-corruption efforts in the Northern Triangle as it relates to immigration and, for that matter, to the flow of narcotics? Well, I think it's very important and hard to do. Um, again, we can't do it for them, but we can, if we can find a willing partner to work with us, help them. And uh, I think that ought to be uh, our, our role. Um, but I can't imagine the, what goes through the mind of a mother or a father sending their child uh, up through this pipeline from Central right. America through Mexico. Um, women and children, female, uh, females in particular, are particularly vulnerable uh, to a sexual assault and other abuse. It's just a horrific uh, trip from Central America through Mexico into the, to the United States. But people still do it because they view that as preferable, a better outcome than staying at home in their own country. And we just have to find some way to work with our, uh, anybody who uh, will be a good partner with us in those countries because I can't really believe that people don't want to stay in the country where they were born if they can possibly do it. Um, the only reason they leave is because it's, uh, it's uh, so, uh, the, 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 that, that choice is so bad compared to the, cha the opportunity they may have to come to the United States. And I think we all understand that on a very human uh, level. Well, one of the things we focus on at, at the Wilson Center, we call it a cross-cutting initiative across our regional programs, is rule of law. Mm -hmm. And it is so crucial, obviously, there uh, we've had some progress in Mexico. We've had some progress in Brazil. Uh, we're certainly looking at the issues in Ukraine, which is mm. a, you know, a, a country destabilized by Russia on the east right. and, and trying to become a, a much more modern, well-functioning country and, and in, in the process of a new election. So uh, you know, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, but right behind Duncan, and Duncan will ask the last question. Yeah, hi, Senator. Um, uh, hold on, I, microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, Hi, good morning. My name is Andrew Christopher, and uh, I too am from Los Angeles. And actually, just last week uh, was with the Pacific Council, a group in Los Angeles, actually in El Paso and Juarez. And we met with Mayor Di Margo, and one of his comments was that we have existing programs like the Becerra program that really helped people come across the border, work, and then return to their country. And is there existing infrastructure that we have that we can leverage to help stem some of this migration problem? Well, uh, Mayor Margo is a good friend of mine. And he's a good mayor in a, in, a, um, in a tough tough environment. You know, it's really interesting listening here from Washington, D.C., how people describe places like El Paso. El Paso is one of the safest cities in, in the country. Juarez, right across the border, is one of the most dangerous cities in the country, although they've, they've tried very hard to improve situa the situation there. What you described, particularly in a full employment economy like we have in the United States now with unemployment so low that virtually every able-bodied person can find, can find work. Uh, employers are having a hard time finding those workers, particularly in, in the ag sector where the Bracero program in particular uh, was very helpful. So having a guest worker program, I think, as part of our immigration solution makes a lot of sense to me because, again, people don't necessarily want to permanently leave their home uh, they might like to come up seasonally and work in the United States 
and then take that money home and invest it in, 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 in where they were born and want to, want to ultimately stay. So unfortunately, in immigration, everything is connected to everything else. And it's really hard to dislodge one of these things. Like, like I mentioned, the DACA issue, this is something that everybody understands. These young adults came here as children, and we don't hold children responsible for the mistakes their parents make coming into the country illegally. So I think, uh, again, the president's instincts there were very, were very good, but we can't seem to dislodge even something like that that I think we see on a bipartisan basis would be uh, important to do is provide them some hope and a path forward because it's used as trade bait for uh, something else. And so that's, that's kind of why we're stuck, I think, on immigration. And I'm determined to keep, uh, uh, keep at it until we can break the log jam. But unfortunately, sensible programs like that get uh, caught up in Well, we in expect that. you to keep at it, just so you know. <laughs> no pressure, but you're coming back soon and you will report. Yes, ma'am. Uh, last question from Duncan. <laughs> Um, you've talked a little bit about China earlier on with regards to fentanyl. Um, the conversations that are taking place in sort of Latin Americanist circles right now are that issues like closing the border and issues like cutting aid to Central America are just creating more opportunities for China in the region. Yeah. So I'd just love to hear your thoughts about what the United States can do to stem that influence. Yeah, I, I, I alluded uh, to that with as far as Russia is concerned and uh, Secretary Tillerson's comment, which I think is still true today. By the way, Ambassador Bill Burns a great new book uh, yeah. talking about his experience as ambassador to Moscow dealing with Putin, I think uh, uh, ratify um, what Secretary Tillerson had to say. But clearly China has been on a search for uh, um, natural resources um, and they are involved everywhere, offering low cost loans to help build everything from ports, other infrastructure to develop uh, their influence around the world. I think um, China is different from, from Russia. I kind of like the way the RAND Corporation characterized Russia and, uh, and China. It said China is a peer, not a rogue. Russia is a rogue, not a peer. Mm-hmm. I kind of thought that uh, encapsulated it pretty, pretty well. But we have to continue to engage with China. Uh, we can't ignore them. Um, and I'm glad that the administration is engaged in these trade negotiations now. I'm a little skeptical that China will ever structurally change because essentially they're run by the uh, Communist Party at the top and they're a police state. Um, It's not a free and open society to be sure, but we can't ignore them and we need to constructively engage with them. And I hope we can come up with some uh, agreements that that, uh, get them to be more uh, willing to abide by the rule of law um, because their theft of our intellectual property is uh, is knows no limits and uh, they've can find strategic ways to invest in the United States to get access to the know-how and the technology, which is the reason why we reformed the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States uh, last year. Um, But we have to stay engaged with China um, so they don't become a rogue. And I think we can do do so uh, uh, if we do it with our eyes wide open and and, uh, work really hard. So that statement is worthy of the best minds at the Wilson Center, what you just said, a complex assessment of a strategic competitor, that's what we now call it in our, in our defense doctrine, which is, I think is a pretty good title for, mm-hmm. for China. And we have here the, the, the Kissinger Institute on China and the U.S., and Henry Kissinger is still engaged, yeah. and he would applaud what you just said. And, and why I repeat it is that um, these are the people we want here to talk to us and help us learn things. And uh, John Cornyn really is a learning senator, and it matters to us that you've been here three times and you have your homework assignment for the fourth time, which might be in this calendar year, so you better work fast. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jane. Great to see you.